Yes, correct, mate. Yeah, grew up on the, the slums of Fitzroy, and uh, my father was a waterfront worker, painters and dockers. Yeah, I was involved in a couple of shootings. Bad, you know, we had a shootout with the police. The first time I shot someone, I was with my father, and he abused me for not killing him because I shot him in the legs. I was 16. All that talk to my gang pulled up, and we pull up, and they all did. Yo, it's your boy King Dave here, and this is the Fallon Show. Hope all is going well. How about you introduce yourself, mate, and where you're from? Yeah, my name is Ronnie. Um, I'm from Queensland, in Australia. Um, originally from Melbourne, went to New South Wales, and ended up in Queensland. So I went through all the prisons, through all the states, and uh, <clears throat> none of them were any good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so he's been around, man. He's gone state to state. So, yeah, our big Ronald Isherwood here. So... Currently, he's actually uh, a, re- a transfer, a recovery transformation coach. So go check out the truth about addiction.com. So um, he's he's coaching people um, how to manage their feelings without having to resort to you know self medicating um, if we call if you call it that or just um, hiding you know through drugs and things like that. So he's good at what he does. Um, he's even better at building hot rods though. So he builds hot rods in Corvettes as well. Those cars behind him, he built all of them. Like the whole room's full of this picture of the pictures he's built. So um man of many trades, a man of many hats, but um he obviously does have a story to tell. Like he just said, he has been through the prison system. Um the last time he went to prison, he was um sentenced to almost 20 years for uh drug smuggling, drug drug importation. Um, so he does have a story of redemption, a beautiful story, and that's what we're all about on the show. So, um, grew up in Melbourne, was it, Ron? Yes, correct, mate. Yeah, grew up on the the slums of Fitzroy, and uh, my father was a waterfront worker, which were the in those days were the criminals, like the painters and dockers. <clears throat> so I was born into painters and dockers. Yeah. Oh, so that was your dad was involved in in that scene. Yes, my dad was involved in the painters and dockers. My first job was a painter and docker. Oh, okay. So you walked. Oh, so you worked down on the wharves there. Yeah. yeah oh, okay. We only did that as a front. You know, they just say you work there, so that when the cops came and go, "Where were you on Thursday?" They go, "I was at work." <clears throat> and the painters and doctors say, "Yeah, no, he was at work." You know, so. Uh, okay. So were you actually working down there, or? <laughs> very, very, very little, mate. Very little. It was oh, more of a front. Yeah. So, so, well, can you just go into that a little bit for my Melbourne viewers about that whole scene and, and what it was like for you? You know, obviously your dad was involved and you were working there yourself. At what age was yeah. this? Is it still a teenager? Or? 15. 15, 15 years, years of age. Old. I was so 15 what, what kind of age. environment was that for you at 15? Oh, it was, it was, it was men. They, they start drinking alcohol at 6 a.m. in the morning. They go down there. They didn't have containers those days. They used to come in in pallets. We would steal as much as we could off the off the boat, and then <clears throat> with the um, the unions would hold the boats to ransom, and say, "Oh, something's faulty." So, you've got to give us another fifty thousand dollars. That's a lot of money in the seventies, you know, late sixties, early seventies. Yeah. You've got to give us another fifty grand, and they would share that between all the the union reps of the of the federal Panthers and Dockers Union. So it was all corruption. Um, then in 1971, they all started killing each other. It got really messy. Um, <clears throat> my father was part of it. It wasn't uncommon for me to come home and my mum to be stitching somebody up who'd been stabbed or somebody been hit on the head with a house brick or a steel bar or taking bullets out. My uncle died with a bullet still in his next to his heart. Really? You know, at 60 years of age, he'd been shot. Like it was normal. That was normal for my lifestyle. That was normal. That was. It was normal to see the coppers come into the house and search the house and take all the stuff out of the house and my old man to be handcuffed and blood all over him but the cops had kicked the shit out of here. That's That was normal. Wow. So I had no understanding of life. To me, all my normals were really, really abnormal. And so <clears throat> in, by 1970, um, I was involved in a couple of shootings Bad, you know, we had a shootout with the police as a as a seventeen year old boy, and I ended up in Pentridge wow. as a seventeen year old boy. I I turned seventeen in September eighteenth, and I was in Pentridge for December. We were doing a break and enter. We broke we broke into a garage and we cut a hole in the wall, and we we're going into the those days. Um, we do warehouse break into warehouses, and it was like a radio rental, sort of like a 
Harvey Norman sort of store. Oh, yeah. We'll taking all the TVs and, mm. you know, all that stuff. You know, it's 1971, so, you know, there's only TVs and stereos. <clears throat> and we had a van, was loading it up, and the cops came. And someone had a gun with us and started shooting back at the cops. The cops started shooting at us. So we ended up by having a siege. As a 17-year-old boy, it was pretty hectic. That's pretty hectic. <clears throat> all right. Far out. Yeah. So they arrested. We got two of my mates got shot. Um, I had some shotgun pellets overspray on my back. And I, I, I'm in the cells. And, um, you know, like those days, they used to, especially for shooting police, they used to beat you. I mean, like, like you can't even imagine the, the torture that these that these grown men could inflict on a 17-year-old boy. <clears throat> and I already had a hatred for the police anyway, you know, because I grew up with watching the police beat my father. And um, while I was there, one of the guys I was, I was arrested with, he, he gave me up, he was my mate, he gave me up for another shooting of a gangster that had been shot six months before that. Really? So I'm 17 years of age. I'm sitting in pantry charged with four attempted murders. And the old guys in the jail, you know, <clears throat> they were teasing me, saying, oh, you'll only get 100 years, son, you know, you'll be right. That was horrific because you walk in and you come off the, you come out of the prison van, handcuffed. You walked into a room with all these men and all the screws would be there. They shaved your head immediately. Just shave, you know, the 70s, we all had long hair. They shaved your head bald. Then they'd, they'd hose you down with this, um, it was called DDT, I think it was to kill lice and fleas. Then they'd make you shower like, there'd just be holes in the wall with the pipes that come out of the wall. And that was what you call a shower. There'd be four or five years all lined up, stripped naked with men. You know, and I was a 17-year-old kid, you know. It, it, it did freak me and it did scare me, but I wouldn't show that sort of stuff. I'd, I'd grown up pretty emotionless. You know, yeah. I'd learned to shut down on my emotions from a very, very early age. My dad was the sort of dad that he would beat you. And if, he, if you cried, he would beat you. The first time I shot someone, I was with my father. Wow. And he abused me for not killing him because I shot him in the legs. And then he was like, you fucking coward. You know, you do that, you know. Dead men don't come back and, you know, square up. You know, if you're going to shoot somebody, you've got to kill them, you know. I was 16. Wow. I was 16 years of age. So he was, a, he was a pretty nasty, crazy motherfucker. And... um the, the founding part is, you know, my old man hated two things, drugs and tattoos. I became a drug addict and I got a full body suit. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? So it's not hard to see what, <clears throat> yeah. in retrospect, I was rebelling against him yeah. when, I, when I went down that path. Of, um, but when I, I had my first injection, they put me on a drug called Ligactyl. Was that while you were in Pentridge? Or? I was in Pentridge, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> that's a psych drug. Because I said I was a schizophrenic psychopath. It was really funny. I'd come back to the cells and an old, older guy there, I'd moved on from the pantry. After we'd gone through our court process, the judge said I was too young to be in pantry and he moved me to a youth training centre. Oh, okay. Because I, was, I, was, I just turned 17. I was a baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I was in a jail with, you know, mass murderers and, you know, yeah, guys. I was, I was in the yard with guys that, you know, there was a guy that was there killing something like four taxi drivers. And we used to call him the taxi driver, you know. He used to laugh and he used to tell us the stories about, you know, he'd get him out of the taxi and he'd say to him, draw. And they didn't have guns and then he'd, he'd draw his rifle and shoot them, you know. Oh, and wow. it, was a pretty, it was a pretty um, sick environment for a 17-year-old kid. And I looked up to these guys. I was in there with Silly Chopper. Chopper Reed was in the, in, the, in the yard with me. We were both boys. We were the same age. We were oh, in the wow. same yard together, <clears throat> you know, like – so what, what was the go, man, like walking into the into Pintridge and did you have to prove yourself in any way? And I didn't, I didn't, because my old man was already a crim, a career criminal. Oh, so he had been to prison as well. So he'd been to prison as oh, well. Oh, okay. So and all the screws okay. knew my father, all oh. the crims knew my father, knew yeah. my family, my surname was, you know, oh, my yeah, uncle had been to prison. So, you know, all the other painters and dockers, because the painters and dockers ran Melbourne. They ran the criminal world. So, you know, you were, you were born into that, that industry. And was it the same it was in prison? Industry. Was it the yeah, same, same in prison? Yeah, the painters and doctors were really highly respected in prison. You know, we, we had the, you know, like the run. And the screws were even scared because you fuck with the painters and doctors, 
next thing your house got burnt down. And I was a kid, you know, and um, I and my father was on one side because they ended up with being a split with the painters and dockers, and they tried to take them over. You know, what was that over? Was that just over money and stuff? Yeah, it was over money. It was over them. There was a guy called Billy Longley. They called him the Texan. I haven't got no time for him. He was he was like in, on our side. And there's another guy called Pat Shannon. He was the other president. And Billy Longley ended up by getting some junkies to kill Pat Shannon at a hotel out at um, somewhere in Melbourne. But those gangs were one side and my father was on the other side. Yeah. So, you know, there's a guy called Jimmy Baisley, Billy Longley, another guy called Peter, really nice guy. I, can't even, I do remember his surname, but I'd rather not say it because I think he's still alive. Um, my dad. And, you know, we'd go out in cars and we'd go looking for these guys and, you know, and because I was a shooter, I was, I, I'm a shooter. I like to shoot. I like to hunt. I've always hunted my whole life. So, you know, it'd be, be like, ah, shoot that fucker over there, you know, and because I, I didn't know any better. I mean, you know, I didn't understand that yeah. shooting people was, you know, create, yeah. creating harm. I had no, yeah. I had no empathy. Yeah. I had no compassion. I was, I was, I wanted to be loved. I wanted to be accepted. So, anybody, if he said to me, shoot that guy over there, I'd shoot him. You know, I have children of my own. To think that someone could do that to their own child is it's pretty hectic. Well, you were going on to say from Pintridge, you went to that. Um, I went to a youth another, training uh, centre called yeah. Marsbury. Yeah. Oh, oh okay. Back. So Marsbury was around back then as well. Yeah, Marsbury Youth Training Centre. Yeah, I got oh, released okay. from Marsbury in May May two thousand uh, May nineteen seventy three. I got released from Marsbury. So how so long did you do that years, time? Thirty, 30, 30, 30 months. Thirty okay. months it was. Yeah. With the remand, because I was on remand for something like six months in Pentridge, I had friends in there that I, I was a boxer, so I had friends in there that trained in my dad's gym who were armed robbers. Oh, okay. Wow. So they were to go across, you know, look after the kid, you know, and I could box a little bit, so I, I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't afraid of anybody. You know what I mean? We're, I don't know about you, Dave, but in the criminal world, it's all bullshit. Yeah, man. There's yeah. no such thing as this fucking honour and make thieves and nah, fucking brother nah. and, you yeah. know. Mate, you go and do eight years, see how many people put money in your property. Go and see how many people come and visit you. See how many people are going to try to root your ex, root your ex-missus, but they're all out there. Now, they're all out there trying to get on with your family or trying to get money off your family or but none of them are there really. As, you know. So I learned that um, that there was no honour amongst thieves. Yeah. There was no real brotherhood that we thought. You know, it was all a lie. Yeah. And then... Um, my drug addiction started in that prison in 1973. So that was uh, so you were well. So is that when you went to Marsbury or before you went? Yes, there? mate. That's when I went to Marsbury. Oh, so your drug use started there. Started there. Yep. Yep. My drug so use started you're, you're there. You've put up. You've been put on the psych drugs though. And... Yep. And I started injecting that psych drug. Oh, okay. Yep. There was a junkie in there that said to me, "Don't take your meds. We'll bring them back and let me see what they are." And he's like, "Oh, cool. You can shoot these up." Oh, I'm gonna shoot okay. them up. In those days, there wasn't disposable syringes. It was a glass syringe, and you know. And he, I turned my head. He injected me, and I remember falling to my knees and vomiting, and thinking, "Wow, how good's this?" You know, you know. Mm-hmm. It was. It was like fuck. I called it remission. Yeah, that's what I called it. I called it remission. While I'm stoned, I'm not in jail. Yeah. You know? So I used those drugs, even though I knew nothing about addiction. I got out of. Um, Marsbury in 1974, had a bad car crash, smoked, started smoking pot straight away. My mate was crashed his car. I came out of hospital. Within three weeks, I was shooting heroin. So in 1974, I started shooting heroin. And I started dealing drugs because that was the easiest way to. And because I'm now a drug addict, the painters and doctors don't want to know about me. Oh, okay. Yeah, so they were still around. Yeah, yeah. Well, I came to New South Wales to the painters and dockers again. Yeah. My dad moved up to up to Sydney. He was back at the painters and dockers, so I moved up to Sydney because they'd all they'd all killed each other down in Melbourne, and we're still killing each other. And my old man done a runner to Sydney, so I got paroled to Sydney. And um, my first son was born. His mum fell pregnant while I was on weekend leave at the boys' home, so my first boy was born. And so we lived in Sydney, but I had become a heroin addict. You know, by then I'd, I'd already started becoming an addict and um, it took over my life completely and I was in and out of prisons. By that stage, 
drugs had started becoming a little bit more popular in prison. So I was selling dope in jail and I'd get out of jail, you know, I'd get, I'd get really fit, super fit, get out, be back within six months, fucked up again, you know, get, get to prison, train up. My mission in jail was to find the sex offenders and, and, and punish them. And I guess that was just another way of um, expressing my feelings, trying to get my emotion out, you know, because I was so angry and so so hateful. You know, I hated my father. I hated everybody. You know, I hated the world. But I hated me. And that's what happened. You know, in 1981, I got clean. I went from prison to a rehab. And the only reason I went from prison to the rehab was because there was girls in the rehab. Now, I didn't go to prison to get off drugs. I didn't even know I was a drug addict. I didn't even know there was such a thing as addiction. Mm. I just thought every time I shot her on up, I ended up in prison. Yeah. So what happened was a mate of mine started writing letters to me and he said to me, man, you know, uh, he's used with me on the street. And I escaped from prison in 1977. And, um, in Sydney there? Yeah, in Sydney. And um, I went straight to the cross, you know, I'm fucking crazy. You know, of course, you know, you're in Sydney, you're escaping from prison, you go to King's Cross. <laughs> you know? So 21 days after I escape, I'm arrested in King's Cross full of a drug called Ritalin, which is like speed. And I was already in psychosis and the cops are chasing me and the headlines of the papers are rogue animal recaptured. Um, wow. but, a, but a mate of mine that was with me while I was using, um, he was a plumber and I'd gone into psychosis and I said to him, you know, cut a hole in the floor, we're surrounded. We weren't surrounded, it was my psychosis. You know, in retrospect, I know everything that happened. Yeah. So Mark cut a hole in the floor. He was a, he was a plumber, had his tools, and he, he fucked off. <laughs> He's not going to stay with me. I'm mad. I'm armed, yeah. and I'm in psychosis, thinking that we're surrounded, and I'm an escapee from prison. Yeah. So Mark did a runner, and so when I went back to prison, he wrote me a letter and said, "Mate, you need to come to rehab. If you put half the effort into getting clean as you do using, you can you, you'll piss this in." So I went to rehab in 1981, and I learned something there that, that I'd never felt before: a thing called empathy, the compassion of another human being for feeling for somebody else. I never had that. I'd never had the empathy. Yeah. And um, a mate of mine had come to visit me, and I'm sure he won't mind me telling you his name. His name is Peter Darby. He um, he came he came into the rehab because he, he was on the run from the cops that Roger Rogerson was going to kill him. And um, he came into the rehab and he said, I came here because I didn't know where else to go. He said, I'm wanted on two murders. And I'm like, fuck, you know. He said, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I said, just stay here. So, you know, cut a long story short, after three days, he gets the compulsion. He wants to go and use drugs again. And he goes, fuck it. I'd rather be in jail. And I started crying because I knew where he was going back to. Yeah. And yet I couldn't even cry at my mother's funeral. When I was nodding his age, I, I had no attachment. That was before I even used drugs, before I used was on full heroin. I, I had no emotion anymore. I'd, I'd stopped having an emotion. And I started crying for Peter because I knew he was going back to the street and I knew where he was going back to. And I knew Roger Rodgerson would kill him because Warren Lane Frenchy was a mate of mine. That um, Roger Robson had already killed Warren, had already killed Butchie Burns, had already killed another guy that was I was in um, Silverwater Jail with. So I knew that he was going to kill him. There was no doubt in my mind that he was going to kill him. I went to rehab originally because of Roger Rodgerson. Really? Because I knew that he was going to he would kill me too if he had a got me. Because I was really good mates with Frenchy before he killed Frenchy. Frenchy was at my house a couple of days before Roger Rodgerson killed him. And he told me he was going to pay Roger off. So, you know, oh. all these loose ends were hanging out. So um, I went to the rehab and I got this empathy and this compassion. And it was the therapeutic value of one addict helping another. You know, for once in my life, psychiatrists and priests, and nobody could get through to me because like, you can't con a con. You know, you can't, you know yourself, someone starts talking shit, you're a gangster shit, and you think you're a fucking idiot, mate. You're just full of shit. You know, you're just talking. You know, just go away and go, go and talk to somebody who's drunk who doesn't understand what you're saying. You're a goose because I, I always say you can't con a con. As soon as someone starts talking shit to me, a little little thing inside my my heart and my head goes like bullshit alert. This guy's full of shit, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's why I teach my children. Honesty is the best policy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's why my my company's called The Truth About Addiction. I've written a book um, called The Truth About Nothing. It's my life story. Oh, okay. No, I haven't published it. Oh, okay. I've never published it. Not yet. I've got it. It's sitting with a friend of mine now who's a pretty smart guy who's trying to get me to publish it. 
Okay. I'm like, I, I don't know. And I haven't written on it for 20 years. It stops on the day of my arrest in 2000 and, um, 2002. Oh, so wow. I, have to rewrite, I have to rewrite the next part of it. But it's already fucking, you know, my mate goes, look, there's already three books in this book now. Just, let's just publish it. And I'm like, man, my children try to read it and they couldn't read it. Mm. It was too hectic for them. You know, my wife tried to read it. I'm remarried, a beautiful new wife. And she read, you know, up until I was about 17 and went 18. She went, I can't do this. Wow. It's not who you are. You know, yeah. they can't, yeah. they don't see that. Yeah. They don't see the guy that's shooting people and it's, you know. Yeah, you've come a safe. long way. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm blessed. Yeah. I really am blessed that I was given this opportunity. And I don't know what works out there, David. I don't know, mate. I don't know. I don't know about gods and all that stuff. I know that there's a loving higher power. Yeah. But it's kept me alive for 67 years. I know that he works through other people. He doesn't talk to me. You know, when I was on the speed, he used to talk to me. Like, you're outside, <laughs> motherfucker. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But yeah, he doesn't talk to me like that, bro. You know what I mean? He's got his own way of he's got his way of com- he's got his way of communicating with us though. You know, he has but he keeps ways. his anonymity. He keeps his anonymity. Yeah. So he, he makes coincidences. Yeah. All these coincidences happen, but it's really him pulling the strings. Exactly. But the way he works, you wouldn't even know that he's worked at all. You know, 100%, uh, man. You know, you and know, that's what, know. That's what I like doing too, you know. I like to if I'm helping people, I don't want other people to know about it. Yeah. Because exactly. I'm doing it to be a big shot, I'm doing, yeah. doing business, man. I'm not yeah. doing service. Yeah. You know, yeah. My service has got to be done with anonymity. My job's a different thing. My I I do my my company, if people ring me up and they've got no money, I still give them the same treatment. Yeah. It's not about the money. Yeah. It's never it's been about the money. It can't be about the money. If it's about the money, it's not gonna work. Yeah. It's not gonna work. You're not gonna carry the message. Very true, brother. Very my true. message is honestly that you can change your life and you can have everything you ever wanted. All you have to do is give up one thing to gain everything. Yeah, man. And that's, yeah. That's the, that's, that's, that's the power of your mind because yeah, our mind is our enemy. Our brain is our enemy. Our brain makes us worry about stuff that hasn't even happened. Yeah. What, what the fuck's that? Oh, I'm stressing out. Why are you stressing out? Oh, next month I've got a job interview. What the fuck are you doing worrying today? Worry about it after the interview. Yeah. Because you've just exactly. wasted a whole month. You know, you've killed a month for nothing, you know? It's all about, an- it's all about anchoring yourself, eh? Really anchoring yeah, yourself. You've got to be grounded. Something. Yeah, got to be grounded. Yeah. And you've got to be in the present moment. Because the way the world is, you can get so caught up and you forget where you even are in the moment. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's all about grounding, yeah, into the present we, moment. I'm a big person that believes in breath. Me too. I think it's important to breathe, man. You got to breathe, you know. So I you, cleaned up in rehab in 1981. Yeah, yeah. Um, met a girl in rehab, you know. Had the rehab romance. I got 39 year old twin daughters from that romance. They're okay. beautiful. They're really successful women, both of them. Oh wow! Strong, wow. successful. They both give me grandchildren. Wow! You know? Happy so, to hear, man. Happy to hear. You know, mate. I'm a success story that my family love me. My wife doesn't fear me. Yeah, I don't sleep with my mate's friends, my, my mate's wife's. Yeah. I don't rip people off. You know what I mean? Like, that's the success. The success is, yeah. and if you come to my house, you're welcome. I don't want nothing from you. You know, I don't want nothing from anybody anymore. I've got everything I want. All I want to do with me, with my company, what I try to do now is try to help people. And I believe in giving, we receive. Yeah, I give back tenfold. People I look after think I'm doing them the favour. They're doing me the favour. You know, I'm receiving so much more than what they're than what they're getting. I believe, you know. Well, after rehab, brother, so you ended up staying out for a good twenty years, wasn't it? Yeah, I stayed out from eighty um, two to two thousand to two thousand and two. Well, how was that years. for you, man? Like adjusting and and after you know the upbringing that you had had during that twenty years of you know, did you get married and? Yeah, I got married. I got, I got, you know, I've been, I got married three times, I think. Um, yeah, I got married three times in that twenty years. Oh, got, okay. <laughs> yeah. I got a twenty-five year old son, a twenty-eight year old son. I got a twenty-five year old daughter. Um, to two different women. Um, mate, I was a good dad. I was a terrible husband. I was a playboy. You know, I was, a, I, was I was still, a, I was still a crook. I was in recovery, but I was still a crook. 
you know, I had massage parlors, I was shifty, you know, I'd buy and sell hot gear, you know, I just, I was still a criminal. I was still living the life. Yeah. And I was 16 years clean and I got arrested for importation. And that was a, that was, that was a fucking rude awakening. People talk about having a spiritual awakening. I had a rude awakening. (laughs) At 16 years clean, I'm in Grafton jail with them. And I turn up the Grafton jail in the, in the bus. Um, I get off the bus and I walk into the reception and the guy that's running the reception is an old smuggler mate of mine. And he goes, hey, mate, I heard it on the radio. I knew you were coming in, you know. Here's your bed pack. So, you know, he's like, here's your bed pack. So that's mine. Yeah. So I get the bed pack, you know, and it's got some cigarettes in there. It's got some pot in there because he doesn't know I'm clean. You know, we've been mates from 20 years, 30 years before, you know. We are all crims together. Yeah. So we get to the cell and I'm a... I'm arrested with my cold cues and it's Grafton's a shit jail. It's a horrible old jail. And we're sitting there and, um, you know, my whole world had stopped. You know, I was married, six-year-old daughter, beautiful, you know, 28 year 30-year-old wife sitting well, at the what, house. What, what were the allegations, bro? What, what, what did they grab you for? They um, Conspiracy to import cocaine. They arrested me for conspiracy to import cocaine and proceeds of crime. So they grabbed you from home or...? No, they grabbed me. I'd been. I was at Byron Bay when the container had been taken to Byron Bay, with the where the the cocaine was supposed to be in the container. And I and I'd left. I'd left Byron Bay, and I was driving out of Byron Bay at ten thirty at night. And the container still hadn't been unloaded, and they arrested me because they said, you know, I was down there to take possession of the coke. Um, there was no coke. They'd already changed the coke in Brazil. Oh, okay. They do, they do uh, yeah. substance out. So people had been arrested in Brazil as well. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. People had been arrested in Brazil, and um, three of us, five of us got arrested. I'm the only one that got found guilty. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. One guy pleaded guilty. He was the guy that that fucked it all up. It was his. It was. Yeah. It's a long story. It really wasn't my deal. It was yeah. someone else's deal, a mate of mine, and he fucked it up and I came in to help him. Oh, okay. And being a goose, anyway, shit happens, you know what I mean? As yeah. I said, mate, if you put if you weigh it up, I'm in front. Yeah. You know, yeah. if you weigh it up, I'm in front. You know, i I um you know, I, I did a lot of shit in the past that I got away with. So, you know, on the scales, I'm a I'm I'm no victim. I said that the pro board and the pro board couldn't believe it. So I went back to jail. This is a really funny story. I'm in the Grafton jail. I unwrap my bed pack. There's some, some white ox there. There's two joints there. I'm 16 years off the drugs. And my cellmate, my buddy that I'm arrested with, is a, is a, is a drug addict. And he goes like, oh, fuck, man, how cool is that? And I'm like, and I, for a minute I'm thinking, do I have a joint? Mm-hmm. And then I, I, think, I think to myself, if I have a joint tomorrow, I'm going to be looking for heroin in the yards because that's the nature of my disease. Yeah. And if I have that one joint that day, I'm never going to get out of jail because I'm going to kill someone in prison over drugs because that's where I'm at. You know, that's the sort of drunk. I'm a junkie. Yeah. And that night I said to him, you can have him. You've got to stand up at the window and smoke right at the window. You know, the little windows up the top of the cells. Do you yeah. stand up there and smoke the fucking joint? I said, I don't want it, you know. And it was a big decision. I sat on sat on a man for twelve months, got out of bail. They froze all our assets. We had, you know, a lot of money, big waterfront home, all that shit, you know. Wow. But you know what, man? My biggest regret was I missed out on the eight years of my daughter growing up. Not the mansion, not the cars, not the boats, not all that bullshit. But it gave me a it gave me an awakening where I'd been clean for sixteen years, but I had no spiritual awakening. I was still spiritually dead. Hmm. I was still, you know, wheeling and dealing, still smuggling, still rotting, you know, still rooting other women, you know, still playing up with my wife and just being a – all I wasn't doing was not using drugs. I hadn't changed my lifestyle. Mm. And that's when I came to the revelation. It's not about the drugs. It's about me. The drugs aren't the problem. I'm the problem. So I had to have a really fearless and thorough look at myself and start doing some work on Ron. And, and, and the deeper you dig – the higher you can go. It's like you want to build a mansion, you got to dig a deep, dig a foundation. So I had to dig this foundation, man, and I really did soul search. I wrote my life story. 
I wrote a letter to my mother who's dead, you know, I wrote a letter to her, you know, just I've got, I've got copies of all that stuff. And then I wrote. What was that? Story. So that, that was during your last, your last leg there. Yeah, during my last oh, leg. And then oh, so, what, so you got out for bail for a bit there though, was it? You got out for bail. About 12 months just to clean yeah. up my stuff. They actually drove me back to Queensland, yeah, because yeah. they knew they couldn't. They wouldn't have found me guilty in New South Wales. They couldn't. They couldn't get the the bullshit in front of the judges in New South Wales that they could in Queensland because the system up here is pretty corrupt. You know, it's pretty one sided. Yeah, mate. One day they're a prosecutor, and the next day they're your lawyer. You know what I mean? What? The prosecutors can do private cases as well. So you got what? prosecutors who, who are defending you. Crazy. Yeah. You know? So yeah. And I'm the only person I know that did a big lag and stayed clean. So maybe he thought that I was that I was the one that to carry the message into the system, because the system is where the the disease lives, man. Exactly. Very true, brother. Very true. So we went in there. We ran the rehab. He left. Of course, you know the new GM didn't believe in rehabilitation. Went back to the old punishments. And as long as you have a faith, you have to have a faith. You have to have a belief that. It's going to be okay. Yeah. You've got like to have you carry that, that higher power. It gives us yeah. strength. You know, we just need to draw upon it. You know, I mean, be, exactly, aware, be, be aware it's there. You know? Yeah. And that's what we try. That's what I try to teach people that it will be okay. No matter well, what, it'll well, be okay. Well, I mean, so you've, so how long did you end up doing, brother? The, um, eight years. The, so you've done the eight years and then yep. what so how did you end up on the path you're on now, man, with the, the truth about addiction.com and, and being Well what happened was when I when I when I did the eight years, I just got fully onto into myself and fully into my recovery. And and got into a spiritual awakening. And I had an awakening of the heart. Um start, and because I'm dealing with people in prison who are the hardest people to deal with. And people were getting clean and people were staying clean and people were coming to me saying, man, thank you so much. You know, I got mum's crying and saying, man, you you know, thank you so much for giving me back my son. You know, wife's crying on visits saying, man, you've, you know, you've given us so much. And I, and I realised that, you know, that's what I need to do. I need to carry this message to people who still suffer, you know. And it's not about drugs. You know, the drugs are, are just a symptom of our problem. The drugs are something we've turned to, you know, this gambling, this sex, this food, there's so many addictions, you know. But the core of the matter is, really, a lot of the time it is trauma. A lot of the time it is social upbringing, where mine was a bit of both. You know, I, I was traumatically fucked up as a kid and I was socially being fucked up from my father and that and from the gangsters and the criminals and being in prisons. But you've got to be understand that, to me, courage now is putting food on the table for my children. That's a courageous man, you know, instead of thinking of someone with tattoos and talking out the side of his mouth, walking up and down the side of the yard, that's not tough. That's fucking stupid. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. When I relapsed last time, this is where I had this crazy awakening, and I don't tell this story much. I dreamt I, dreamt I died. I, I'm in active addiction. I'm shooting up her on. I dreamt I died. And I went to this place, I don't know where it was, but, you know, there was this cold and I felt like I used to feel when I was walking through customs, you know, I felt really scared. And and I got there and there was a guy with a beard and, you know, I'm trying to justify all the things I've done, you know. I'm like, man, I never shot anybody who was innocent. I only shot gangsters. You know, I'm justifying all this stuff. And he's standing there really quiet. And he, 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 he lets me talk all this shit for about five minutes. Then he smiles and he says, you don't get it, do you, Ron? And I remember the cold feeling and he said, you committed the greatest sin man could commit. And I remember the fear, feeling that cold fear, and I thought, oh, fuck. He said, you wasted the gift of life. So it had oh. nothing to do with the crime. The crime was that I wasted the gift that was given to me, the thing called life. Wow. Now, every day I try to live that gift. Every day yeah. I try to give that gift to somebody else. And I believe oh. by giving the gift, I've received the gift. Yeah, no, come well, what happened was I came out, parole board was all over me, tried to be on, tried to keep me on social security. I'm not a social security guy, mate. I like nice cars. I like, you know, nice things. Um, I said to them, no. They said, well, you can't go back to the, you can't go back to work. Because I used to work in drug and alcohol before in rehab. Oh, okay. yeah, back in the early days when I first got clean, I went and worked in a drug rehab. They said, you can't go and work in a drug rehab and you can't go back to the jewellery industry. And I said to them, well, the only other thing I can do is smuggle. 
And they went, oh, you can't do that. I said, well, you're stopping me from doing everything I can do. And the only things I've ever done is this, this, and this. I said, you're telling me I can't do that one or that one, so the other one is smuggling. And they were like, you can't do that. And I said, I'm going to open a company. So I went and opened up the, the Sugar Man Clash with the car behind me, all the cars. And we started building cars because I've done cars my whole life. And they were okay with that. But all the time I've still kept on helping people. You know, that's my, that's my passion. That's what I like doing. Um, I, I have 10 people basically that I, that I've had, I've got, I've got some guys that I've been helped for 20 years. Wow. You know, I, I just keep helping them, you know, I just keep helping them. I just keep helping them. Even when I was in prison, people used to come into prison and I talked to them in prison. And when people try to talk to me, cause they get the wrong impression of me, you know, I've got a full body suit and I've done a lot of jail and I'm a, I'm a career criminal and they start talking shit to me and I go, stop, please. Tell me how you put bread on the table for your wife and children. Mm. You want to impress me? Tell me how you bought your child a fucking car when they turned 17. Tell me how you looked after your grandchildren. Tell me how you helped the poor guy I sit on the side of the road with no money and you took $10 out you took him in and bought him some McDonald's. I'm so blessed. People can't believe I say that. People used to come and visit me in prison and say to me, how can you be so happy? Because I was helping people. I have to get paid. Right? That's not my motivation. That is not my motivation. I do more for zero than I do for money. I did yeah. probably tenfold more you know, for yeah. zero. You know? And the people that can't afford it still get the same treatment. Yeah. I don't care where you come from, man. My information is for free. And if wow. you can afford to pay for it, great. If you can't afford to pay for it, great. It doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. It's not... It cannot be the motivator. It can't be. It won't work. Yeah. I believe we, we dilute the message if we, if we have a motivation of financial gain or ego or anything like that. It has to come from the heart. It has to come from, the, from your soul. It has to be compassionate and empathetic and it's got to be honest. It's got to be real. It's got to be the truth. That's why it's called the truth. I love the yeah. truth. Me I too. love the truth. Man, <laughs> the truth will set you free. Yeah, exactly. And it's so hard to find the truth nowadays, though. Eh? With so many lies we see everywhere, it's hard to get the truth. But it yeah, kind of leaks out. It finds it finds the people that deserve it. Apart from staying clean, being a dad's a really, really good achievement. My children trust me. They're not scared of me. And they know I tell them the truth. And they've been taught morals. And they've been. And one of my daughters runs a drug rehab. Wow. My other daughter runs a nanny service. You know, they're. They're, they're good kids, you know, and they're 39 years old now. These are the ones that I met their mum in rehab, you know, and, my other, you know, my other kids are good kids, you know. My kids are good kids, man. And that's I believe you judge a person by how their kids treat them. Yeah, well, that's right. Brother, thank you so much for sharing your story, man, coming from, you know, Melbourne and the whole painters and dockers scene, brother, um, going through the jail systems in Sydney and Queensland, man, I commend you for absolutely everything that you're doing. The truth about addiction.com. Go check it out. Um, and if you want uh, Ron over here to drop his book, leave it in the comments. Um, let him know. Everyone comment. We want to see his uh, biography. And um, I'm sure we're going to get a few comments there, but because like, I would actually love to see that. I would love to I'll see that. I'll let you know that. if it happens, man. I'll let you know. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Dave. Well, look, man, uh, much love, brother. Sending you all the light I can. And um, we'll talk soon anyway, my brother. Be safe. See you, brother. <laughs>